Welcome back. Up next, we're going to be tackling the macroable classes in Laravel. Now, a macro is a simple way for you to add your own functionality to the built-in classes in Laravel. Now, a lot of times you'll extend the class if you have to do a lot of work, but macros allow you to tap into these classes and add your own functions to them. Now, there are quite a few of them, so I've actually written a nice blog post that you can visit so you can reference and figure out what classes are macroable. And here is the entire list. So as you can tell, there are quite a few of these classes that you can add your own functionality to it. Now, I don't expect you to understand exactly what I'm talking about just yet. So let's jump right into the code and figure it out. So let's go to PHP Storm. And what I want to do is pick a class that is macroable. And then let's do a quick dive through the source code, figure out how it works, and then figure out how to add our own macros to one of these classes. So let's pick the collection class. Let's go to the collection class. That's going to be under illuminate support collection. And if you look right up here, it is using this macrable trait. So what exactly is a trait? When you see this use statement up here, which is obviously different than this use statement up here, what it is is that we are adding additional functions that don't exist in this class and that allows you to reuse these exact same functions in different classes. So the macrable trait, whenever there's a class that is actually using the macrable trait, it inherits two methods that are important to us. And if we go to this macrable trait, you'll see that what we have is this static function called macro. And the second one is this mixing of macro. Now we will talk about both of those, but the very quick explanation is that this allows you to add one macro at a time where a mixin allows you to pass in an entire class worth of macros. So if you have more than one, this is probably the best way to do it. Additionally, you see things like has macro. This is what you would use if you wanted to check if the macro that you're trying to use is available. Now, we are not really going to dive into this, but here is the very important part. And this is the backbone of macros. So you may be wondering, well, how can I add my very own classes? Well, here it is. Whenever any static function is called on the particular class that is using this macrable trait, of course, as we learned in the previous lesson about facades, anything that doesn't exist will fall back to this magic method of PHP. This is just a PHP language feature that we have. So call static is any static method that don't actually exist on the class. So the very first thing that it will do in this if statement is, well, does this class have a macro by the name of method, meaning the very first thing that got sent in. And if it doesn't, then of course it's going to say, you know what? I don't have anything for you because in this case, we just don't have a method that matches that name. So if we get past this initial gate check, then we go ahead and set the macro equal to the macro that we're looking for. So the way that it works, let me jump back up here. Whenever you register a macro, the only thing we're doing is adding to this macros array. So initially the macros array is totally empty. So every time we call this macros function, we are just appending to this array, whatever the macro name is. So down here, all we are setting is fetching the correct macro from that array and setting it to this variable of macro. So then if the macro is instance of closure, meaning it's a function, it's a callback, it's something that we can actually call. Well, in that case, we're actually going to invoke that function and we're going to return whatever the result is. And then we fall back to this last step, which is we actually just invoke the macro. And then you see that we pass in any of the parameters that we can actually have. So we have a couple of different ways that a macro can be called. So that's a very quick and dirty of how macrobles work. So how about an in action example? So let me go to my app service provider. And of course, you can do this in your very own provider or even in a package. And this is very useful for packages. So right in my boot method, let's go ahead and add a macro for the str or the string helpers. So the way that you would declare a macro is first and foremost, of course, we're going to use str. That's illuminate support str. It's a class in level, which of course has a bunch of string helpers. And if you actually check out the helpers, you see that there are quite a bit of them. But for the sake of this lesson, I'm going to make up a brand new one that doesn't exist. 
So to do that, to add the macro, remember we have that macro function, this one right here. So if we call that macro on str, now before we even go on, let me take a quick pause and let me show you something inside str. If I navigate to illuminate support str, notice here that it is using macrobol, exactly the same way that this collection class was also using macrobol. And it's using the exact same one. So as a matter of fact, in your very own classes, you can even use this macrobol trait if you wanted to, you just have to make sure that you import it like so at the top. All right, that was just a quick side note of str. So now we can actually add our macro. Now it's going to take two parameters in here. So the first one is going to be the macro name. So I will make one for part number. And the second one, of course, is going to be our actual callback that we have to actually generate this macro. So remember, whenever we call str part number, we're going to invoke this function right here. Now, if we are going to pass in any parameters or arguments into part number, we can accept all of those right inside this function call. So I will actually accept a part as a part number, and this is just going to format a part number for us. It doesn't really exist. I'm making this up as I go. But let's just say that for the sake of our program, it needs to return something like a b dash and then maybe the first three digits of whatever part was passed in. So we can simply do that with sub str, meaning give me a subset of the current string. So as a first argument, we'll pass in our string. We'll start at zero and end at character three. And then after that, let's go ahead and add another dash. And then finally, let's get the rest of our string. So we can do that using sub str as well. But in this case, we're not gonna pass in a third parameter. We're just gonna say, go ahead and start at three and give me the rest of them. Does that make sense? This is just a very simple string helper function that our fictitious application is going to have. So we're going to pass in a part number of some sort in some sort of format. And I want to get back a B dash, then the first three characters and then another dash and then the rest of the characters. All right. So as a playground, let me jump into the routes file and let's add some stuff here that we can play with. So I'll just actually just die and dump and I will use str again. That's illuminate support str. And now we have access to this new part number. Remember, this doesn't really exist in real Laravel. I added this on the fly. So now as a part number, I will just simply type a bunch of random numbers. And now when I head back to the browser, I'm going to hit refresh on this and check that out. So we are currently formatting that string. So we've just added our very own function into a Laravel function. And that's what macros are really good about. It allows you to inject your very own stuff into the actual stuff that ships with Laravel. How cool is that? Very cool stuff, very useful. So again, if we actually disable this and we head back in here, of course that doesn't exist. So we get this new bad method call. There's no such thing as a part number. It doesn't exist. So of course, once we turn that back on, we hit refresh. There we go. So now we're working. So now our entire application has access to this new part number function globally as an entire thing. So pretty cool stuff. What else could we use these macros for? Well, there's another one that's very useful that I use sometimes, which is the response factory. Now, of course, out of any controller, you can always have some sort of error. So it would be nice to maybe have a pre-made error response that you can just call and say, you know what, something happened. Here's my error message and I'm done with this request. So how about if we worked on an example for that? So let's add a new macro for the response factory. So the response factory is what actually gets called whenever we send out a response. It generates a response. As the name suggests, it is the factory of responses. And of course, right away, we see that we have access to this macro method, exactly the same method. Let me show you one more time just to drive the point even further. I'm going to jump into this response factory. And again, notice how it says it uses macrobol. Again, just to reiterate, I've actually included the entire list of every single class that is macrobol. And of course, we do see the response factory being one of those. So any of these classes that you see here are macrobol. Of course, we used str 
and that one is down here. So just keep that in mind, keep this blog as a reference so you know where you can add your very own classes, which is, to be honest, in just about everywhere in Laravel. We seem to have added Macrobol to just about the entire framework. So now in this macro, let's create a new one for error JSON. Again, it's going to be a made up response that I want to return every time I get an error. So in here, we'll have a function and this one's going to be a simple one. I'm just simply going to return an array and this is the formatting that I'm going to use. I'm going to say message. I will have some sort of default error message here. And of course, if I wanted to, I could pass in my message right through here. So we could say maybe message and then let's actually default error message right here. And then let's go ahead and just use message. There we go. So now it's customizable. Pretty easy, pretty cool trick. And then of course, let's have some sort of error code that doesn't really exist. And it's going to be just error code one, two, three. All right. So how do I use this response factory? Let me head back over here. And I'll actually comment that one out and let's make a new return statement here. And I want to return and say, you know what I want out of this. I'm not interested anymore. So I can say response. That's going to be the facade response. So eliminate support facades. And I can simply just call error JSON. All right, let's give this a go. Let's see what we get. Refresh. And there we go. So we have our default error message with error code one, two, three. Now, again, if I wanted to customize that message, I can say a huge error occurred. Boom. And sure enough, a huge error occurred. This allows you to really encapsulate some of the logic that is application specific for you without having to extract something like a service class. And sometimes we jump too quick into extracting things into service classes. Macros are a good alternative for something like this. So, all right, so let's take it to the next step. What if I had a bunch of macros that I wanted to declare all at once? Now, as you can imagine, if I kept declaring them over and over in this boot method, it's going to get kind of large. So why don't we create a dedicated class just for macros? So those are called mixins. And if you remember from the macroable trait, we had this second method here of mixins. And again, all it's doing here is just simply taking each of them and just doing the same exact macro call as we would do one at a time. That's it. There's nothing fancy about this method. It's just a simple for each statement that assigns a macro every time it finds one. It's as simple as that. So let's create a new directory under app and we'll call it mixins. Inside of mixins, let's have a new PHP class, which is going to be called XDR mixins. Exactly the same as our actual SDR class. That way it kind of matches and you have a nice naming convention. So how do we declare these mixins in this class? Now, at first they look a little bit funky, but you kind of get used to it. So you're going to have a public function and then the name of the public function is going to match the name that you want for your actual macro. So in this case, it'll be part number. So we'll put that in. So public function part number. And then what we have in here is we need to return this entire function. So we're going to return this function that we have right here. But of course, at this point, you may be wondering, well, how does part come into play? I am not accepting part inside part number. But if you remember, this is actually being called a little bit differently than what you think. And actually we have an extra parentheses. So let's get rid of it. So remember that this function right here is actually only going to be saved into this macros array and then it's going to be called. So it's not that we're going to be instantiating and actually calling part number on this specific class. All we need is just a function basically just as a self-contained function. We're not going to actually run it until we use that. All we're going to do is just store it inside this array. So that's why we can actually have part, even though we are not accepting part in the public function itself. So, okay. So why don't we create a second one that doesn't exist yet? So let's create another public function. And this one's going to be called prefix, another made up function that I will have. So we'll return a function out of this one same exact thing. And so in here, let's go ahead and just return whatever gets passed in. So let's go ahead and accept a string and then we'll accept a prefix and it'll be something like, all right, prefix dot string. So basically I am just concatenating these two things. However, let's go ahead and default the prefix to something like a B dash. 
So again, this has to do with part numbers. It's just the made up example that I have for this project. So great. So at this point, we've got these two functions, but of course our application doesn't know anything about them. So to add them in, I will actually comment this out. And on my STR, instead of calling the macro, I can call the mixin. In the mixin, all you need to do is just new up this new str mixin class that we created. Now do notice that str mixin did get imported up here at the top. So that's why it's going to work. So at this stage, we actually have access to both of these methods. So part number and prefix. So let me bring back this die and dump for part number. And if we ran everything correctly, of course, we are still running. Furthermore, we now have this new mixin that we didn't have before, which is called prefix. So let's go ahead and prefix that. And if we hit refresh, there we go. So we have AB dash because remember, we are defaulting the prefix. Let's change this to ABCD dash. And when we hit refresh, now we have ABCD. So now we have a nice contained place to actually have our macros. And I actually think that this is probably the best way to use macros because if you only have these functions declared in the app service provider, it's going to be a little bit difficult for somebody who is not as intimate as you are with your application's source code to find these actual macros. However, if it's right on the app directory and it's called mixins, I think it's pretty obvious that we are adding some sort of functionality that doesn't actually come with Laravel. So, all right. So one last thing I want to show you, and then we'll be good to go for this lesson. So the last thing is sometimes your mixins actually have conflicting methods. And here's what I want to show you. I still have this part number right here. And of course, let me go ahead and change my part number here to other. So what do you think is going to happen whenever I call part number? Because remember, we are setting a macro of part number and then we're adding a mixin of part number. But part number in here is called exactly the same thing. So we basically have two macros with the exact same name. So who is going to win this battle? Of course, this one is going to get declared first and then the one inside the mixin will get declared. So this one right here. So let me go back to my example and let me uncomment that part number one, two, three, and let's see what happens. So there we go. So right now other is winning. So even though we actually had this first, our mixin overwrote this up here. So as a second optional parameter to the mixin method, you can pass a Boolean. So the Boolean is false. And what we can say with false is, do you want to replace anything that is already by the same name? And if you hit false, by the way, the default of this is true as we already experienced. We saw that the mixin actually overwrote our original part number we already had declared. So if you don't want that functionality, there we go. So passing in false as a second argument in your mixin will allow you to not get your other macros overwritten. So a pretty useful function whenever you're trying to compose with several different mixins and you just don't want anything to get replaced. Now the nice thing with this is that if you have a mixin but it has some methods that are only specific to one part of the application, you can always override the one macro right before and just make sure you pass in false as a second argument. So that's a little bit more of the power user option that you can have with mixins, but that's going to be it for this lesson. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson on macros. And again, don't forget to check out this entire blog post and make yourself familiar with all of the classes available that are macrable in Laravel. Thanks for watching.